Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's review is sponsored by Squarespace, and we're gonna be looking at Cassie Ho from the popular YouTube channel, Blogilates. Now, if you're not familiar with Squarespace, it's an all-in-one platform to run your business, whether you're looking to build a website, blog, online store, or use their marketing tools and analytics. As a blogger myself, I love that Squarespace has a number of SEO tools to really take the guesswork out of making your site Google friendly. And it also has appointment scheduling tools for online booking or coordinating calendars. I also obviously do a lot of social media, so bloggers will really find the social sharing buttons helpful while also setting up email campaigns for mailing lists. When everything in your digital presence works together like this, it makes it so much easier for you to focus on your actual business. You can check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Abby Sharp to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Okay, so now let's get on to Cassie. If you're not familiar with Cassie, there's a lot of ground to cover. This video was heavily requested by all of you after a lot of you felt kind of triggered by Cassie's how to tell if it's hunger versus a cravings Instagram and TikTok video. We'll be doing a deep dive into that later. I also know Cassie has a long complicated history of being painted as both a body positive influencer and the poster child of a diet culture. So I did want to explore that a bit as well. This video will not be a traditional what I eat in a day review, though we will see some meal reviews but I mainly want to answer your question on whether or not Cassie can be a body positive influencer and still want to lose weight and whether you can be body positive and lose weight as well. Of course, before we jump into my review, I want to start with my general disclaimer that the information in this video is for entertainment and educational purposes only, and you should always seek out the help of a registered dietitian or medical professional for your unique needs. Also a trigger warning that I will be talking about weight loss numbers, and also a reminder to please be kind to both me and Cassie in the comments. Now let's start with a little bit of a history on Cassie's content. Back in 2015, Cassie posted the now viral video called The Perfect Body, where she discussed some of the horrible fat phobic comments that she would get on her channel that really questioned her ability as a trainer because she didn't have a six pack or prominent ass. At its core, the video was a powerful response to the assumption that one's body and looks determine their worth and success in their job. This is such a hugely problematic assumption, so of course I'm happy to hear Cassie address it in such a powerful, shareable format. Now in response, Cassie was labeled as a body positive poster child, a title that was totally turned upside down when she announced her 90 day weight loss journey last August. Now in her video, How I Lost 17.5 Pounds in 12 Weeks, Cassie described embarking on a wellness journey to get herself into the best shape of her life, both physically and mentally. According to her, this meant doing more workouts that she actually enjoyed, like dancing, cooking for herself because it would bring her joy, and blogging every day to not let others' opinion of her censor her true self. All of that sounds great and obviously well aligned with body positivity, gentle nutrition, joyful movement, and body kindness. But then she also announced specific number goals for her weight and body fat, and that's kind of where people lost their shit. So what did her journey look like? Well, Cassie described working out six days a week, doing a combination of running, Pilates, hit, dancing, and weightlifting. She basically said her workouts actually didn't change that much from what she was doing before, but she did throw dancing into the mix, which she said she loved for stress release and fun, which to me is really a great example of joyful movement. It doesn't sound like she was making herself totally miserable to ramp up her activity. So that to me is a great sign and well aligned with body positivity. Food, however, is where she obviously made the most changes to meet her goals. She started off doing what she calls lazy keto, AKA not counting macros or calories per se, but just focusing on eating lots of fat. She even describes this phase of her diet as being fun, which is great. I mean, we want food to be fun. 
But after she hit a weight loss plateau, she decided to cut out cheese and nuts, which is where it kind of sounds like the fun diet ended for her. If we're talking body positivity and intuitive eating and how that intersects with weight loss diets, I would have to say that if you are having to remove foods from your diet that you enjoy specifically in response to weight loss plateaus, it's probably not an intuitive way to eat. She also describes getting on and off bouts of keto flu, which is a series of symptoms including headaches, fatigue, dizziness, and digestive distress that come on as your body tries to adapt to running on ketones instead of glucose. The keto diet, especially at the beginning, can cause severe shifts in electrolytes and fluids, as most of the weight lost at the beginning is largely water weight. So this explains why she started to feel better after she increased her salt intake. But she ultimately came to the conclusion that if keto required her to do all of these extra things just to feel normal, it wasn't the diet for her. So she switched back to a more typical way of eating for her with more fruit and less fats. And not surprisingly, her keto flu symptoms went away. I wanna say that I do think even in the context of weight loss, this is a good example of collecting data about how food makes you feel and making adjustments based on what does and does not feel good. So I am happy to hear that she abandoned something that just didn't feel right for her body. Next, she talks about hitting another weight loss plateau, which was when she decided to start calorie counting using MyFitnessPal. According to Cassie, tracking her calories gave her mental space to breathe because she wasn't needing to calculate the numbers in her head all the time. Now, I know I've criticized calorie counting in the past, but I do get a lot of feedback from you guys that for some of you, calorie counting may help you feel less obsessive about what you eat. And this may be because you don't have to constantly worry about whether or not a food or meal is supporting or negating your weight loss goals, eliciting excess and unnecessary food guilt. I mean, obviously, I would argue that we don't need to feel guilty or worry regardless that, you know, our bodies are a lot smarter than an app if we were to just tune into them. But I also know that not everyone is at that stage in their intuitive eating journey. Now, in terms of weight loss, research has shown that counting calories can support weight loss goals as it does provide an easy way to kind of self-monitor intakes. However, it's really important to note that not all calories are created equal. Foods that may have the same caloric quantity may be vastly different in terms of their nutritional quality and therefore have different impacts on your overall health, satiety, satisfaction, and how you feel. For example, if you ate just fruits and vegetables, you would probably take in fewer calories than had you added in some tofu or nut butter or whole grain bread. But you also may not feel emotionally satisfied or physically satiated, and instead might be left feeling really bloated and fatigued. Not to mention, you wouldn't be getting a wide variety of nutrients that you need for your body to thrive. So listening to only these external cues like the information on a MyFitnessPal app can easily override a lot of important information from your unique body. Having said all that, if counting calories is something that works for you and your goals, I mean, that's totally great. But in my books, calories are not king and are not more important than balance, variety, and the internal messages that your body is giving you. Now, Cassie also discusses weighing herself daily to keep herself honest and give herself something to objectively work towards. Interestingly, at one point, Cassie even acknowledged that she hadn't stepped on a scale for a few years before that because of the way it would affect her emotionally, likely because of her history with orthorexia. So let's see what she has to say about her past disordered eating experience. So back in 2012, I entered a bikini competition and got down to 113 pounds. So I was eating around 1,000 calories a day. Plus, I was working out four hours a day, doing intense weightlifting. So my body was totally depleted. Okay, now I want to hop in here with some thoughts on using the scale and specific numeric goals, especially in the context of past disordered behaviors and thoughts, like basically what Cassie is describing. Now, the scale is just one tool. So I'm not against using it if it doesn't trigger you and, and your appraisal of yourself. 
But as we know, weighing ourselves consistently can become a real obsession if it's the only tool that you're using to gauge how you feel or your progress. This is particularly true for people that have a history of disordered eating. So I would have just been concerned that this would be really triggering for Cassie. Daily weigh-ins is not something that I generally recommend, period, but especially for people with body dysmorphia or disordered eating. But according to Cassie, she has since retrained her brain to get out of the orthorexic state of mind and was able to shift towards a journey of self-love, regardless of if that meant losing weight or gaining weight. In her words, she says she appreciates her body for what it can do and is grateful for it regardless of its size. Now, I think that this sentiment is amazing and ultimately what body kindness is about. But then my question is, why the need to set specific body weight and body fat goals if there was an equal appreciation of one's weight going up or going down? I think this is where the lines get a little bit tied for some of her followers and I'm gonna explore that in more detail soon. Now, Cassie also describes the daily weigh-ins as a clinical data collection and pointed out that there were naturally a lot of ups and downs, which is to be expected as our daily body weight is constantly fluctuating as a result of things like menstruation, dehydration, caffeine and alcohol consumption, sodium intake, and bowel movements. Hence why I don't think that the scale is the best tool for daily progress anyways. But if we are going to use it, we would definitely be wanting to look more at overall patterns and not absolute daily numbers. Now, while I myself am a bit confused by the mixed messaging that we have of, you know, having clear weight targets and simultaneously saying that you're on a journey of self-love, regardless of what the scale says, it's ultimately not my place to judge if particular actions are done from a place of self-care or body distrust. So if this all felt good to Cassie, and the experiment resulted in some net benefit to her, physically and emotionally, then all the power to her. Now, what was the result? Trigger warning here, folks. I'm gonna talk numbers. Now, within 90 days, Cassie lost 17.4 pounds, which is 13% of her body weight and 3.6% of her body fat. The CDC recommends losing no more than one to two pounds per week, which is not beyond what Cassie lost. But I would say that with a starting weight already in the normal BMI category, a 13% loss in three months is pretty drastic. As for her body fat, she landed herself at 20.8% body fat, which had her straddling the athletic and fitness categories for body fat. Now, typically for most women, 20% is still high enough to maintain normal hormonal patterns and menstruation. But Ultimately, everyone has their own fertile weight and body fat percentage. And according to amenorrhea expert, Dr. Nicola Rinaldi, the specific body fat percentage is less of an issue for hormone regulation and regular menstruation than the caloric deficit needed to achieve that. So Cassie noted that the lowest that she would eat was around 1200 calories, and that fluctuated based on what she was eating that day or what she felt like. But considering her activity level, my calculations put her needs at closer to 2,100 calories as an average per day, even with her goal of weight loss in mind. She also said that because her calories were not too low, that she never experienced starvation mode or adaptive thermogenesis, which is essentially when your metabolism slows down to compensate for getting in inadequate amounts of fuel. But it's really important to point out that you can experience metabolic adaptation or slowed metabolism at caloric intakes well above 1200 calories. So what was enough for Cassie's body may not be enough for you. It's also really hard to know if your body has really been through metabolic adaptation or suffered metabolic damage until you go off the diet. And I'm not entirely sure if this way of eating was something that she's just kind of maintained. Now that we have that backgrounder, let's now move to discuss some of the reasons why a lot of you are confused about Cassie's stance when it comes to body positivity and weight loss. First things first, I want to take a look at her TikToks and Instagram posts, beginning with a couple quickie what ain't a days that she shared on her feed. Let's take a look.
Okay, excuse the wardrobe change here, folks. My mic apparently cut out, so I had to reshoot this little wee bit here. But anyways, in response to these two days that she shared, even though we are seeing a lot of lower carb alternatives like cauliflower rice and jicama wraps and paleo bread, because she's got a good amount of fruit in here, we actually have a generally good balance of fat, protein, and carbs. There's even a little ice cream in there for good measure. Now the calories are moderately low, I would say around 1300 calories on both days, but we already knew that that was Cassie's approximate caloric goals based on her kind of 90 day journey. Other than the fact that, like I said, I think the calories are generally a bit low, even for weight loss, given her activity level, there isn't anything inherently super restrictive about these meals if this is what feels good to Cassie. And considering that she herself suggested that she feels better eating a lot of fruit, it does sound like she's just kind of listening to her body with these meals, albeit maybe perhaps with some caloric restrictions as regulated by her MyFitnessPal app. I didn't hear her mention that she feels really hungry or restricted eating this way, so I am just really hoping that this level of restriction is not an uncomfortable experience for her. Next, let's get into some of the explicit diet tips that I've been sent from a lot of you guys on Instagram and TikTok. Sometimes I get so bloated, but I'm gonna show you guys what I eat to go from this to this in just a few days. The most important thing is that you stay hydrated. So I make lemon water with a ton of ice and I drink at least 64 ounces throughout the day. Meal one is a vegetarian bowl over cauliflower rice. Then I'll have a plate of berries as a snack. Meal two is a plate of ground turkey, sweet potatoes, and cabbage. My snack, some fresh cut watermelon. Meal three is salmon with collard greens and zucchini. And for dessert, some kombucha for healthy probiotics. Most importantly, give yourself time and don't stress. Your body is resilient. Okay, so I can see where the tension lies within the context of the body positive movement. As I mentioned in my video on bloating, often the phrase, I feel so bloated, has become the socially acceptable alternative to, I feel so fat. Likewise, getting rid of bloating is a less controversial version of losing weight. That doesn't mean there aren't non-diet related messages out there related to reducing bloating, since Let's be real, bloating can be physically uncomfortable and can sometimes even be a sign that something is physically wrong, but it often comes down to the specific information that's being shared. In Cassie's case, I do appreciate the message in the copy of this post that sometimes you want the churro, so have the churro, and sometimes you'll bloat and sometimes you won't. To me, this is aligned with body kindness and intuitive eating in that Sometimes we gather information that a particular food doesn't make us feel so good, but we choose to eat it anyways because YOLO, you know, it feels good in other ways, whether that's emotionally, culturally, socially, etc. But I don't love the line that follows, which was that your body will heal itself when you eat nutritiously again. I mean, to a lot of viewers, this may insinuate that you're damaging your body by having a churro or that your body is damaged if you don't have a flat stomach like Cassie. I also find that a lot of wellness YouTubers kind of sandwich their diet culture messages with anti-diet messages like give yourself time, don't stress, you're resilient, etc. I don't think that was necessarily Cassie's intention as I know it's just so hard not to use language that isn't inherently rooted in diet culture. I mean, we're all guilty of doing it even when we're actively trying not to. But I think we can all try a little harder to reduce this nuanced language to slowly change how we talk about and think about our bodies and food. Meanwhile, for those watching me right now, I want all of you to know right now that it's very normal for your stomach to not be flat. Many women will never have a completely flat stomach and it's not because they didn't have kombucha for dessert. In fact, when I dug deeper into Cassie's videos, I did find another one on bloating back in April that I felt had a much more body positive message. In it, she basically said what I just mentioned, and that was, it is okay and totally normal to be bloated once in a while. Bloat isn't bad, but it can hurt and be extremely uncomfortable. She also talks about taking mental notes of what she's eating, how she's feeling, and how it affects her body. 
All of this is beautifully aligned with what I always talk about when I say that intuitive eating is all about collecting data. And I think this is a much more supportive way to talk about bloating and digestion in general. As for the recommendations itself, I don't have any major issues with Cassie's diet in this video if this is what's working for her. Even though, let's be real, 30 calorie kombucha is delicious, but it's not dessert. But I do want to flag that this is not a foolproof diet to reduce bloating in one to three days like her video suggests. On the positive side, we've got lots of water and water-rich produce going in, which of course may help flush out excess sodium, which may be causing water retention. But on the flip side, I'm not sure I would recommend a lot of cabbage or cauliflower rice for people who are trying to de-bloat, as a lot of people find that cruciferous vegetables can trigger their gas and bloating. Also, if you're sensitive to FODMAPs, and this is what's causing your bloating, foods like watermelon, cauliflower, mushrooms, some cabbages, blackberries, avocado, and even kombucha are all high FODMAP, and therefore may actually worsen the bloating problem. The carbonation in kombucha also probably won't help. So bottom line, while this diet may work for Cassie for her bloating, I would argue that these are not universally recommended strategies for bloating relief and may actually make things worse for people who are legitimately struggling with bloating and other digestive issues. And because of the inconsistencies in the messaging here, I can't help but feel that these meals are much more aligned with weight loss tactics than anti-bloating recommendations. Again, that maybe wasn't Cassie's intention, but I can see how it was easily read that way by her followers. And despite me seeing Cassie's effort to separate herself from heavy diet culture in this video, I think for some viewers, the waters may still look a little murky. Okay, let's move on. Next, I want to address the video that clearly rubbed you all the wrong way, as it's probably been DM'd to me like 50 times. And that video is how to know if you're actually hungry versus just craving. Let's take a look. Well, her video suggests that you do the banana test to see if you're actually hungry or if you're just having a food craving. And this is really just an offshoot of the age-old diet culture tactic formerly known as the apple test. But I don't know, I guess apples are out of season. But anyways, according to Cassie, we should ask ourselves if a banana sounds good to eat or if you only want a burger or cookie. And if you choose the cookie or burger, you're not actually hungry. But if you choose the banana, go eat. I mean, it's no wonder so many of you sent me this clip in a panic. In the copy, Cassie talks about how she's just not an intuitive eater, you know, she's an emotional eater, and that throughout her 90 day journey, she was able to really see how often she was mindlessly eating and which emotions were triggering those tendencies. But here's the problem with this test. Just because a banana doesn't sound good to you right now, does not mean your body doesn't deserve fuel. Hunger can be more nuanced and multifaceted than just having an empty belly. So for example, some people like to differentiate between stomach, mouth, and emotional hunger. Stomach hunger occurs when we have a physiological need for food to sustain our body functions. We can typically recognize stomach hunger as our stomach growling or our energy level dropping. Now, mouth hunger is our hunger for specific pleasurable characteristics of food. So for instance, we know that we're feeling mouth hunger when we really are hungry for a certain taste, texture, or smell. Like honestly, I have basically had mouth hunger for watermelon my entire pregnancy, so there's that. Now, emotional hunger occurs in response to how food makes us feel emotionally. And while diet culture and this post of Cassie's would insinuate that eating for any reason other than stomach hunger is bad, it's actually really normal and healthy to eat for a variety of reasons. In fact, sometimes all three of these hungers are occurring at once. Desiring a particular food because it satisfies an emotional need or a flavor desire really needs to be more normalized in the wellness community. If it was, 
we would probably be able to be more likely to enjoy a piece of celebratory cake and move on rather than spiraling into a guilt cycle that results in us polishing off the entire cake. When we eat out of emotional or mouth hunger, the key is to acknowledge it, move on, and not let the emotionally eaten piece of cake dictate your attitude towards your body, yourself, or your next meal. So emotional eating is not inherently bad or abnormal, but when it becomes our only coping mechanism, that is when we may need to do some reflection to understand why that is. Now, another way of thinking about this is to differentiate between physical satiety and emotional satisfaction, which I've talked about in this video right here. The problem is that if these two things are not well aligned, we often go pantry surfing until we get what we actually need. A banana may satisfy our physical hunger, but not be emotionally satisfying. So we might eat the banana, feel a little bit more satiated, then we eat the rice cakes, the baked chips, the diet ice cream, and a bag of jerky, desperately searching for the satisfaction that we crave. Meanwhile, maybe a burger would have satisfied both our need for satiety and satisfaction, and we could have just moved on with our day. Thankfully, after a lot of public backlash from this post, Cassie updated the post to clarify that she didn't mean you should never have a cookie or burger, and if you make that conscious choice to eat dessert, do it, own it, and enjoy it. So I am hoping that she got the memo on why this test could do more harm than good. It is still up on her Instagram, so I don't know, maybe that's just wishful thinking. And before her copy edit on the post, I would say that this post was marked pretty heavily with diet culture rhetoric. And it's not surprising it resulted in so much public disappointment and outcry. Next, I wanna look at some other content we've seen on Cassie's channel and how these pieces of content paint Cassie's ever-evolving brand. First, let's look at her research on fitness influencer beauty standards. Now, in a video called The Unusual Beauty Standard for Fitness Girls, Cassie does a pretty cool analysis of the top fitness influencers and how they compare to other influencers and also the average woman. Not surprisingly, top fitness influencers have a look of being largely white with prominent abs and a round ass. And Cassie wonders how much greater her following would be if she maybe fit this mold. While I do think this cultural analysis is super interesting, I can see how it might be interpreted as a little off. First of all, I can appreciate the pressure that fitness influencers feel to look a certain way, that this idealized body is nearly impossible for most women to attain. But at one point, Cassie talks about being proud that she was in the top 100 fitness influencers list, despite having this body. I think it's a bit tone deaf to refer to her body as this body, when she still looks nothing like the average American woman likely ever will. She even pointed out herself that the average American woman is a size 16 to 18. And while I don't know what size she wears, it's definitely not size 16. She may be a visible minority, and I think that we need a lot more of that in the fitness world. But just because she didn't have a six pack before her challenge, doesn't mean that her body is not an example of ideal, and otherwise unattainable for 99.9% .9 of her followers. So while I do appreciate Cassie using her analytical and evidence-based mind to do a deep dive on this topic, I think the point would have gotten across a lot better if she had profiled some awesome fitness influencers who actually look like the average North American woman or who are in larger bodies. So people like Louisa from Curvy Girl Meets Yoga, Jesse from Curves With Moves, and Roz from Roz the Diva. Yes, the fitness industry needs a lot more diversity, so let's promote that. But yeah, this one to me kind of missed the body positive mark. Next, let's talk about her body love challenge. Now, in her February video called Don't Like Your Body, This Video Will Change That, Cassie promotes a Pilates retreat that she was supposed to host this summer, which I assume is no longer happening thanks to COVID. As part of the marketing for this piece, she promotes the Body Love Challenge, which suggests a handful of daily exercises to promote a healthy relationship with your body and mind. Exercises like name one amazing thing that your body lets you do, or name five things that you love about your body, are all strategies that I've talked about before as part of the intuitive eating series. And 
I love that they take the focus away from how our body looks towards what our body actually does. Research suggests that self-affirmations like these can actually reduce stress and improve health-promoting behaviors like eating more fruits and vegetables. So yes, they actually work. I do have to say that if this is the type of information that would have been passed around at the Pilates retreat, it's really too bad that it isn't happening. But regardless, I would at least say that the sentiment behind the Body Love Challenge is a supportive one that we definitely just need to see a lot more of. Now I want to discuss the response video Cassie posted in the wake of the pushback that she got on her 90 day journey entitled The Complicated World of Body Positivity. I admittedly love this video because I'm a total history geek and she even talks to the body positive founder Connie Sobzak plus two plus size models. I was so happy that Cassie specifically said that she wanted to interview larger bodied women who had a different lived experience than her because it was important to hear their voices. But anyways, in this video, she largely focuses on how body positivity has become a marketing ploy for a lot of major brands and how even body positive brands discriminate by hiring largely women who are white, have an hourglass figure with thin necks and faces and high cheekbones. As modeling agent Chelsea Bonner said, You're allowed to be curvy as long as you have a really tiny waist and no cellulite. It's a shame that the fashion industry has co-opted this movement for financial gain, but of course, I'm not surprised. Now, the video then explores both sides of the argument on whether or not you can be body positive and want to lose weight. And after discussing both sides of the argument, Cassie comes to the conclusion that how you answer this question ultimately really depends on how you define body positivity. And the thing is, there is no one agreed upon definition. So I thought that I would throw my own ring into the hat and answer the question, can you be body positive and want to lose weight? Like Cassie said, it starts with the definition. And to me, body positivity at its core is a belief that all bodies, regardless of their size, shape, sexual orientation, color, etc., are worthy bodies. Being body positive is about giving yourself permission to love, take pleasure, and provide self-care to your body, even as it changes throughout the life cycle. For a lot of advocates of the fat liberation movement, a desire to lose weight is inherently at odds with body positivity because it highlights societal fat phobia. If being fat wasn't so bad, why would we want to shrink our bodies so badly? But as I discussed in my video right here, I personally believe in a more nuanced approach. The same way that I think eating a lot of kale salads and smoothies can be seen as either healthy or orthorexic, wanting to lose weight can be potentially against or aligned with body positivity. I think it really comes down to intention and actual behaviors. To understand your intention, I would start by asking yourself, why do I want to lose weight and what am I willing to do to lose it? If you want to lose weight to look more attractive and are willing to participate in restrictive diets and punishing exercise regimes that interfere with your quality of life, then I would argue that that may not be body positive. But if you want to lose weight so that you can physically or mentally feel better, move better, or have a better quality of life, and the behaviors that you're taking inherently feel good to you, then this may be body positive. I want to flag that I'm not shaming women like Cassie for having aesthetic goals. I mean, we are an aesthetic driven culture, so it's almost impossible to resist the desire to look a certain way, especially in the fitness industry. But it's worth at least acknowledging these societal pressures and what chasing these goals may mean for our general health and happiness. So if the journey of losing weight is an act of self-love, and finding health and happiness is the ultimate goal with weight loss being just one variable that may or may not occur, then yes, I absolutely think that this is compatible with body positivity. I believe that for a lot of people, health can be achieved without weight loss. And for others, perhaps it can't fully. That's not really for me to determine for each individual. It's also not appropriate for me to determine some kind of cutoff weight or BMI where it's okay for one person to want to lose weight, but it's not okay for another. I mean, what is that arbitrary number? Obviously, a lot of people would look at Cassie in her pre 90 day journey state and say, she was healthy then, she didn't need to lose weight. But again, I am learning that 
tearing women down for being at different points in their body positive journey is not helping the problem. It doesn't change the societal pressures. It just shames women for being too powerless to overcome them. So does Cassie's purposeful weight loss make her anti-body positive? Well, first of all, I want to flag that it sounds like Cassie never wanted to be a spokesperson for the body positive movement. She just made a video largely about her experience with online bullying in her industry. It went viral and suddenly she was given a status that she probably didn't expect. Second, I can see why there's been a lot of pushback because the public branded Cassie as the body positive ally and depending on how body positivity is defined, a lot of people may see her 90 day journey as being inherently anti body positive. But I'm beginning to appreciate that none of us can really ever know what is body positive to another person. Looking at Cassie's content as I did in this video, I do see a lot of diet culture messages intertwined between body positive or body kindness messages. I can see why that's confusing for a lot of you, but my take is that Cassie is clearly on a journey and because she's a public person, she's on a very public journey and these journeys are rarely linear. Even for myself, I am still learning and trying to find my crystal clear message and voice, but I know that will always change as I evolve and grow. And that's a good thing in my opinion. It's also so hard not to get sucked into diet culture because these messages are just so pervasive. It's really easy for our diet culture roots to show and for these problematic statements to slip out even despite our best intentions. And as an influencer, it's also easy to give into public pressure. And while body positivity is having a bit of a moment right now, it's nothing compared to the overwhelming public interest in how to look smaller or how to lose weight. So in conclusion, if Cassie's content isn't supporting your body positive journey right now, there are a lot of other great influencers whose message is more direct. So I'm definitely going to leave a link to some of my favorites below. And if you too feel troubled by the push and pull to love your body while simultaneously wanting to lose weight, my advice is to focus on what is working for you and no one else. If weight loss is what feels good to you and helps support your physical and mental health, you do you. And if staying the weight you are, even if society says you shouldn't, is supporting your well being, that's great too. Do not let anyone or anything, including the unfortunate public backlash against Cassie's journey, inform what is best for you. And on that note, a big reminder to please be kind in the comments, both to myself and to Cassie. I would love to know how you define body positivity and if you think you can be body positive and want to lose weight. So definitely leave me a comment below. And of course, another big thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you liked it, don't forget to give it the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.